What game are you missing tonight? Uh, Bengals and the um, no T Higgins Ravens. tonight. Ooh, that's a good game. It's tonight. a good game. It's an important game. I might actually watch tonight's Thursday game for the first time in a while. What do we root for? <laughs> injuries. Oh, you're right, right. This is divisional. <laughs> this is this division, is divisional. two divisional rivals, and we yeah. root for injuries. Right, right, right. Yeah. See, I don't have to worry about football this weekend because— You don't have to worry about football for the rest of the year. We're you're true. done. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief. I did, I did pick up Bailey Zappi in one of my leagues just to stash on the bench just in case because I think Mac Jones is done. I think he's lost the locker room. Yeah, could have. That, that sounds plausible. Nice tie, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> out of all, out of every time, uh, of the many, this is what, episode 135, and you're just now realizing that I don't wear ties to this? I, I just finally got in touch with my, my inner feelings about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Let's jump into it. I, I just <laughs> did. <laughs> Let's jump into the podcast. Um, oh. <clears throat> On this episode of the AAF Exchange, the latest economic news, Congress's stopgap funding measure, and new research on the income earned income tax credit. Joining us is AAF Douglas holtz and later on, Gordon Gray. Doug, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So, Always a joy to be with someone in a nice tie. <laughs> You know that the, the beginning part will already will probably make it in, in is, as our little banter before. Just making sure. But I'm glad that you again <laughs> brought it up, and I know that's not what's on the top of your mind. But I know that is on the top of your mind. But it shouldn't be the only thing on the top of your mind. So why don't you tell us what's on your mind today? Uh, I'm currently enraged about digital discrimination, uh, which is a, uh, an initiative by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. Um, they have adopted the disparate impact standard, which means that if you do a broadband po uh, project, it has to have equal outcomes for everybody, you know, for uh, uh, African Americans, whites, Hispanics, NFL fans, NBA fans, uh, you know, golfers, tennis players, Hispanics, you know, yeah. every dimension, it's got to be the same, which is just ridiculous. So this is a ridiculous standard taken at face value and what happens if you're asked to adhere to a ridiculous standard you don't play mm -hmm. and so this is a great way to inhibit uh broadband expansion and and uh, and to, to cripple broadband pricing it's a way for the fcc to basically command and control the entire internet which is not broken but they're going to break it either here or they'll break it in net neutrality or they'll break it in both places but what's really a a galling about this is they know they're doing it because they exempted the projects that are under all the big um, infrastructure bill and uh, special um, digital divide funding. So they have this big beads program. And they say, well, if it's a beads thing, no, this doesn't apply. But anywhere else it does. So they know it doesn't work. They know it's a bad idea. They go mm -hmm. ahead anyway. Yeah, so this, this was born out of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. You know, a lot of people... I mean, obviously, both sides sort of supported this legislation, and then now the problem is coming how the FCC is interpreting some of the statutes. It's that. worse than that. It's worse than that. It's worse than that. They, they, there's the infrastructure bill. Mm -hmm. There was then just broadband money uh, in this in this beads program, that, which is uh, a successor, just standalone. There's there have been several swaths of money put out there for for broadband expansion to close the digital divide, make sure everyone has access to high speed internet. Great. This is a separate thing. The FCC has just decided they are going to have digital discrimination rules for the internet. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And so it's coming in from left field, literally left field, and it makes no sense. It's, it's going to be at odds with what they want, which is to get broadband to people in, a, in an effective and, and affordable fashion. So Interesting. So, you know, shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> well, on that note, should but we... But I'm good. I'm good. I'm not upset at all. <laughs> I, I, we have to get equal outcomes between listeners yeah. of our podcast and non-listeners, too, right, so they right. better check that. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll definitely get right on that. I mean, you wrote about this in your dish this morning, so... Or was it was it this morning? It was, or, it, was a little, it was it was a few. It was either it was sometime this week. I think. I'm glad to see it was memorable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so on that happy note, should we talk about the economy? Sure. <laughs> um, so let's start with you know where we usually start when we're talking about the economy, and that's inflation right now. Um, this week, uh, CPI report showed that inflation was flat for October. Um, cue the celebrations. Um, yeah. I mean, we saw the financial market 
uh, market's response. Right, exactly. So what, what do you make of this report? So uh, it's easy to figure out the report. If you want to know what's going on with top-line inflation, uh, look at what happens with the energy prices. The energy component of the CPI fell at an annual rate of th over 37% in October. And that explains why the top line came in flat and why the year over year moved down to 3.2%. If you wanna know what's going on with core inflation, you just gotta keep track of what's going on with shelter. Shelter inflation in the month of August was 3.2% annual rate. In September it went to 7.2, went back to 3.2. So we saw the, the core come down to four year over year. But that means the core is at four, which is twice the target. Mm -hmm. And so we're not done. But there is steady progress, albeit at a pretty slow rate. Yeah, so I mean, I saw a lot of the, some of the reporting around this was, you know, home price or uh, rent was it rent and home prices went up, um, so that was sort of concerning. And then there were some food prices that went up, and then of course, um, I think used cars was the other one that went down, which was kind of kind of nice to see. So there, there are a couple of things about people's response to the inflation issue that are interesting, right? So if you look at food and gasoline, people don't want inflation to go away. They want the prices to go back to what they used to be. Yeah. And that would require actual deflation, and that's not really what the Fed's aiming for. And so mm -hmm. there's a continual disappointment that like the, the food prices are not what they were three years ago. Right. That's that's baked in the cake at this point. Yeah. That, so that, that's, that's one thing. The other is that, um, you know, people, tend to focus on one price or another when in fact inflation is by definition the the broad increase in the price level mm -hmm. and so they they mistake those two a lot and, and then you know you, you just have to acknowledge the fact that um the inflation takes a long time to get rid of it and we're just coming right. to grips with that one of the other things that to keep an eye on is economists like the core because it gives you the best predictor of the where the, the overall inflation rate the top line is going to be a couple, couple years out but People don't pay the core. They pay the whole CPI. And so they get the break when the energy prices go down. They're happy about that. And they get furious when the food prices go up. They're mm -hmm. unhappy about that. So you do have to keep track of that. Like I always look at food, energy, and shelter. Yeah. that That's still going up well over 4%. So it's above the trend still. And, and people are paying that. And they don't like it. Yeah. Now I now I can uh, put a feather in my cap because I got you to talk about food on the podcast. So. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Our standards have gone sub-zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so what about the Fed on all this? You mentioned they, yeah. they're watching this closely. What, what, what was, what's their next move? Um, th their current mantra is uh, higher longer. So they're going to keep rates higher than people had thought they would have to uh, at five and a quarter and longer than people might expect. And if you look at, at markets, they're always pricing in a cut in the federal funds uh, rate somewhere three, four, five months out. Um, so I think that means the Fed just stays on what appears to be hold because they're not moving the federal funds rate. But remember, they're still tightening the portfolio. Right? They're running that, 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 that $5 trillion of increase in the portfolio that went on the pandemic. They've gotten rid of $1.2 trillion of it, and they're continuing to go. So that's going to continue to uh, tighten financial conditions. And it is true that for every interest rate, as the inflation rate falls, real interest rates are, are, are going up. So they're sort of in a, in a very passive way, tightening all the time still. Mm -hmm. um, okay, what about, uh, you know, earlier this week um, in your DISH column, you wrote, you contemplated the question, um, has the Fed cooled the labor market? Um, what, what was your takeaway there? I, I think the answer is unambiguously yes. Um, there are a bunch of different ways to look at it. I wrote one short piece on the so-called SOM rule, Claudia SOM said that if you look at the three-month moving average of the unemployment rate, if it goes up half a percentage point above the, the previous low in, um, in the unemployment rate, that's the predictor of a, of a recession. Well, we're at um, 0.4, so uh, by that measure, the labor market's cooling. Um, if you look at actual jobs plus job openings, so that's jobs we'd like to, to, to staff, that's a measure that, that's come down dramatically. Um, and the growth in, in jobs we'd like to have is down to 
1.7%. Uh, it was 1.3 before the pandemic. So we're getting back to sort of more normal labor market conditions. Yeah, and then uh, I think the retail sales numbers came out today too that further Flat. suggest that people are starting to save money in anticipation. It, my take on the economy is not as optimistic as a lot of people. And, um, you know, the, if you just start with the most recent GDP report, 4.9%, everyone gets all excited. That's a very big number. 1.3 percentage points of it is inventory, so that's transitory. It's going to get leveled out. Uh, another 0.8 is uh, government spending, so that's Bidenomics in action. So now you got 2.8 percentage points of growth that have come from the private sector. Zero come from uh, non-residential investment. So equipment, intellectual property, non-residential structures, flat, dead flat. That's usually a bad sign for the economy. And the household sector, of course, is spending like mad, and everyone's all happy about that, but the savings rate has plummeted in recent months, and credit card debt's ramping up, and so the, you do have to wonder how long will it last, and today's retail sales report says maybe in October things really did flatten out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see as we get into the holiday season if that changes, and if it's, I mean, I know it's ingested, but. Yeah, it, this is where I think we've had the most trouble pandemic, post-pandemic, is, is in seasonal adjustment, mm -hmm. you know. What is what is a normal right. buying pattern around the holidays right. anymore? Who we're, knows? We're going to see Black F Friday sales. We're going to see Cyber yeah, Monday. We're having pre-Black Friday sales now. Yeah, so that, I so, noticed that. I got so, a few. So what know. does that do? Right. Like, literally to the monthly data. If it's all showing up in November now instead of none of it in December. Yeah. I'm keeping my eye out for some good deals out there this time, but we'll see how that we'll see if that yeah. if that pans out. Um. So, what does the current state of the labor market? I mean. You, you, you said you're not as optimistic about the future of the the outlook of the economy not the future, but you know what are we are we in recession watch what is the potential of a recession in 2024 I'm in recession watch and I think the probability of a recession in the next six months is over a half I mean I, I think we're still you know I thought that was true the fourth quarter looks like I'm probably wrong but I think the fourth quarter is on track to, to go from 4.9 in the third quarter down to something like one and a half to two in the, in the fourth quarter. It's flattening out, and I and I worry about early next year. I, I, I do. Interesting. Well, we'll have to, well, I'm sure you'll be back on to talk I about that as we put the economy behind us in this podcast for now, but uh, should we do some trivia before I let you go? Oh, why not? <laughs> Fire away. I know it's your favorite section, <laughs> so. Um, all right, so by what, so this is some research that Tom Lee did, okay. um, so you know it's in trade. Uh, what, what percentage does our own Tom Lee estimate that revoking China's permanent normal trade relations would decrease total exports? 13%. 17.4%. Ah, I bet it's the 10% tariff paper. I got the papers confused. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a big deal. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, pr it's pretty timely since, you know, the president is meeting with uh, Xi Jinping in, in California right yes. now. So, I mean... It, it's it is very uh, it, I think you know it says a lot about the global economy that and what they're and what they're talking about yeah I, I th and I think um, that's an extreme version it also hurts the US economy pretty dramatically so I'm not a, a, a big fan of this as, as a policy but you know in general we are walking away from trade um, the administration had just a disastrous move in my view with the, the US trade representative saying we're no longer going to support at the WTO these provisions that uh, are going to stop countries from doing data localization or forcing you to deliver your source code. And there's all sorts of intellectual property problems there. And they're interfering with digital trade in, in, in a tremendous way. Well, that is the future. And so we're really just backing off something that's essential for success. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope maybe there'll be something that comes out of this to to turn the but it, um, to turn turn things around but I mean this has been happening since the previous administration it's been this yes. slow slide against decoupling um, the it's, economies it's it's been going on for a long time I mean I I'm now officially old and um, but I remember in 2001 so that you know, we're talking 22 years ago uh, when I was working at the White House we were able to get trade promotion authority for then President George W Bush uh, by one vote in a Republican controlled House of Representatives. Trade has been a contentious issue for a long time in the U.S. Interesting. And we're seeing it. Interesting. Well, we'll have to see how it continues to play out. I'm sure it'll be a hot topic on the, the campaign trail next year, so we'll be talking about it again. Yes. So thank you. We're going to bring on Gordon now, but thanks, Doug, for thank coming you. on and talking about all the economy yep. and all this other fun stuff. My pleasure. 
Let's now bring in AAF's Vice President for Economic Policy, Gordon Gray. Gordon, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. So how have you been? It's been, I mean, you know, you've been following some things, but, you know, it's been a couple of weeks. Yeah, I've been just peachy. Uh, looking forward to the Las Vegas Grand Prix this weekend. Oh, yes, um, I forget that's what's going on. And uh, I gather the federal government uh, will be open. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great, too. I'm so, sure. yeah, let's talk about this. <laughs> I mean, um, this week the House passed a so-called laddered continuing resolution mm -hmm. to keep the government funded. Um, the Senate is likely to follow suit and the president will probably sign it to avert that government shutdown. Um, you know, first, just explain to us how this laddered CR works, because sure. I don't think there's a lot of us that are familiar with it. Uh, it's uh, no, no, more, no, no more simple than uh, a CR. Um, with two different expiration dates. Essentially, a uh, continuing resolution is uh, essentially a shorthand approach to legislating, which is uh, they uh, draft a piece of legislation that more or less says legally, legislatively, okay, the 12 uh, ap appropriations acts that uh, uh, are embodied in the last continuing resolution. We'll just change the the dates uh, on that CR, and instead of changing one date, which is to say moving the expiration date um, that w uh, was to be the end of this week to you know some some date in the future, they got clever and they <laughs> said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna instead of one expiration date, we're gonna have two. <laughs> That's all it is. Um, the rationale is that to the extent that you've more or less split the, uh, the, the funding act into two different deadlines, that this will somehow preclude being jammed by the Senate or being stuck with, um, as has uh, often been the case in history, sort of a 1,200 page last minute bill that is essentially all 12 appropriations acts, the bills that fund the government, um, and they gotta do it in the middle of the night and nobody reads it and stuff. Um, uh, it's not obvious to me why two, having two expiration dates precludes that. Um, that outcome is a function of Congress not doing their job and eventually mm -hmm. um, uh, accumulated interest prevails over, over another. And, and that's how the, the omnibus uh, typically plays out is it happens at the last minute and people are like, get me out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless I had the wrong date, they did move it past the holiday season correct so, so yeah. it's into early next year so yeah. we're not so there won't be this whole oh we want to go home for christmas we need to pass correct this. yeah they gave kind themselves um gave themselves a pass for the holidays the um the the the, the expiration dates are interesting in that um for a um uh a portion of the the cr um basically four of the the acts in the that that uh, Congress is supposed to pass four of the 12. They expire um, uh, January 19th. And then for the remaining eight, they expire February 2nd. If you look at the House calendar, at least, is uh, the 19th uh, is a Friday, and then the House is out for the <laughs> for the following week, and they come back a week <laughs> later, and then that Friday is the second. Interesting. So, uh, you know. Uh, we've we've seen this movie before. I, I think they're just kind of rearranging the deck chairs. But this was the deal they needed to keep the government open, so that's why we yeah. Why we I got mean, it. good. What we got past the government shut. We got past the government shutdown. We averted it. We don't have to for deal now. with that for now. And I mean, that's something, I guess. Um, but it still runs out early next year, as we were just talking about. What does I mean? What does Congress need to do so we're not? in the, exactly this situation a few months from now. I mean, is it passing those appropriations bills or like how do we, how do we, yeah. get, to, yeah, how do we get to a funded government and out of the crisis mode? So the, the, the reason why um, they're able to strike these deals and have been um, is because with the exception of, of uh, costing then Speaker McCarthy his leadership position, um, they, there aren't any fights in these. They're not fighting over spending levels. They're not fighting over the stuff that you would fight over if you were actually legislating on um, uh, on 
fiscal policy or or in policy writ large. Um, part of the reason they can't pass these acts is because there isn't agreement, particularly uh, um, certainly between the chambers, among Republicans, among Democrats. Um, and so what a CR does is it just says, all right, ignore all that. To the extent that we, the government is open right now, keep it open. Mm -hmm. That's really all a CR does. It just basically says, whatever we're doing, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't grapple with uh, security needs. It doesn't grapple with right. um, uh, any of the uh, f uh, fiscal policy challenges that we have. And yeah. so that that's why they are kicking the can down the road. And ultimately, the disagreements that they have are going to have to be reconciled at some point. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 just from a from a logical standpoint, it seems like, okay, each we, we have different priorities from year to year. I mean, what was true last year is probably not true for this year, so we should be having a better conversation about, okay, where do we want to put the money that we've appropriated mm -hmm. here? You know, our security change, you know, last year we didn't have a situation in the, as big of a situation in the Middle East, you know. The priorities for for Ukraine and Russia change and, you know, just looking at the security alone, but then, you know, there's all these other appropriations bills that appro and then, as you also mentioned, fiscal responsibility here. I mean, that's the big rallying cry for a lot on the, you know, a lot of people saying we need to get our house in order, but it's not really, a CR is not really grappling with those. Right. Uh, let us recall that uh, the House Budget Committee marked up a budget resolution mm -hmm. and it's hasn't seen the light of day on the on the house floor so they're going through all these motions and uh getting a case of the clevers with this laddered cr stuff <laughs> they have a process that was enshrined in the congressional budget act of 1974 and it says you know has a nice orderly timeline section 300 of the act that says when you're supposed to do stuff it's a a road map and they have a process and they choose not to not to follow it mm -hmm. and so and and then they periodically and selectively pick fights and invoke fiscal responsibility but ah, no one's doing the hard work yeah i mean we're still what eight years away from what what for, what is it is it eight years still from from insolvency and in some of our so we have products? you know the the trust funds for right. our uh two major uh, health and retirement systems are now, you know, what used to be long-term problems is now near and medium-term problems. Mm -hmm. These programs are in and of themselves a financial threat to the beneficiaries to the extent that they are insolvent w I within uh, the budget window, fundamentally. Yeah. And um, no one in Congress is talking about it, and barely anybody uh, and certainly none of the likely nominees for the presidency appear to be at all interested or serious in dealing with this. Yeah, I mean, it might be time to finally pass budget jail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you were right. talking That's about right. budget I'm jail. Still, still perfecting the, the ledge text. Yeah. <laughs> Never right, got well, that one on the floor when I was in, on the Hill. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I'm sure you'll be back on in early January, and we'll be having the same conversation about shutdowns and budget funding um, because something about, you know, history repeating itself um but before, that old chestnut <laughs> before i you know i you I, you're on the podcast today and i don't want to let you go before we talk about a piece you had out um or, or last week that i got you know a lot of it, some attention and i think it deserves a little bit more attention because i think it's a pretty good piece on the i don't think so <laughs> on the earned income tax credit um you did some great research on that um start by talking to us about the basics of the EITC, nailed it. Yeah, you did. Uh, right on. Uh, All four letters. And why it's important. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even get them out of order, too. That's no, what I was most amazing. scared about. I'll tell you. <laughs> Firing on all four cylinders. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about it. Um, it was uh, the EITC is a uh, a unique federal program, unique in that it was the first. Uh, what's known as refundable tax credit. A refundable tax credit is um, kind of a, a, a unique animal in public finance in that uh, it operates um, uh, sort of on both sides of the budgetary ledger, which is to say, um, uh, to the extent that as a taxpayer, uh, you have a positive income tax liability. So at the end of the year, 
uh, based on your income and, and applicable tax rates. If you owe the IRS money um, or over the course of the year, um, then a refundable tax credit um, will uh, at first reduce your tax liability. So it's a tax cut, mm -hmm. tax tax credit fundamentally. And then if you have no tax liability, so f think about um, you know lower income folks who between this um, standard deduction um, and just a relatively uh, modest incomes, um, when all said and done, may not have a positive um, tax liability, a, a refundable tax credit then still sends them uh, a check uh, basically for um, any amount uh, sort of beyond uh, their, their tax liability up to the maximum amount of the credit. Um, and so, um, and the design of the, of the EITC is also um, geared toward uh, incentivizing work. So it's in, called the earned income tax credit to the extent that you get a credit for every dollar um, you earn in active uh, work and it ramps up. Uh, so for each, each additional dollar you earn up to a certain amount, you get uh, up uh, a certain amount of a uh, of a, a credit for that work, and then it plateaus, and then it starts to decline. And basically, the way that works is is incentivizing work, right? So it's basically, oh, if I worked another hour, I'd get um, even more money mm -hmm. in terms of the income from the work, but also a d an additional amount in in the earned income tax credit. So. Um, the way it's designed, we're asking it to do a lot of things. We're asking it to at once incentivize work, so get people in the workforce. It's providing just straight, straight up any poverty effects. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these design features um, uh, involve trade-offs. And so the paper looked at the evolution of the tax credit, sort of how what its design is, how much it costs, how it's evolved, and then thinks about uh, what could what tweaks could we do to sort of manage some of these trade-offs? Yeah, and so in in those trade I mean those tweaks that you make, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned in your piece that it hasn't really been touched, it hasn't been changed since it was passed. I mean, it just it got it had I mean, a per I mean it w w was some minor mm -hmm. it was it was like minor tweaks or stuff like that. Uh, fundamentally, like 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 all things, sort of dollar amounts yeah, change. Yeah, right, right. Um, a little more generous, um, but the sort of the basic architecture. Mm -hmm. Uh, has remained essentially the, right. The so, same. so if you were advising policymakers, mm -hmm. you you know your alleged director on the hill, um, how would you suggest they update this policy? So, I th one thing that is striking when you look at the EITC is that um, for childless adults, um, the 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 credit uh, is relatively modest. Essentially. Um, the difference in having no children and, and one child, the credit is six times more generous uh, with the addition of a child. Now, understandably, like you know, part of the goal of the program is to reduce uh, reduce poverty, and and you know, we rightly prioritize reducing poverty among families. Um, uh, however, it is the case that the childless EITC is um, can entirely um, and relatively modest. So for about a third of all EITC claimants mm -hmm. are childless, mm -hmm. not even 4% of the amount of the roughly $59 billion uh, in 2020 uh, in EITC payments. So a third of the, of the claimants are only getting roughly 4% of the benefit mm. just because of the design. Um, to be and we, we want to talk about trade-offs here because there are no free lunches and so it could be it, it would be costly to to introduce parity or anything like parity uh, with childless adults and the research literature is actually is uh, doesn't have an awful lot to say on how this population would respond we know that um, uh, single mothers um, or, or that the EITC was a um, uh, the literature has found a significant effect on, in, on encouraging um, uh, mothers to, to work, and, and uh, uh, there's a real finding in the literature about how responsive that population was. Um, we're less sure about how the childless population would respond. Um, so to the extent that we are living in a world where we're bound by budgetary constraints, 
um, you know, we just do need to weigh some of these some of these trade offs as we go forward. Interesting. Well, it was a really good paper, and I will we'll make sure to include the link to it in the show notes so that people listening can go click and read it because it's good paper. Um, so thank you for coming on today Thanks to talk about me. that paper and also our ongoing um, watch of the federal government funding. Um, I'm sure we will be back discussing hopefully a final a a, a final passage. My watch has not ended. <laughs> Your watch has not ended. <laughs> I haven't heard that one in a while. That's right. Thank you for coming on, Gordon. 